Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you this evening because of the privilege we have in Christ that Jesus Christ has given us. We praise your name because we have tasted of the fruit. We ourselves know what it means to be saved. And you are giving us this commission to reach out and go and tell other people. And you are telling us to march on because if we are not looking back, we shall win the day. Father, we are asking you that tonight you will challenge every one of us into action in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that your word will find a conspicuous place in every one of our hearts. And what you teach us, we will pray through on them and we will stand by them and do your perfect will in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide us safely through. In Jesus' name we pray. For some weeks we have been studying the word of God concerning spiritual gifts. We have also been given the spiritual exposure and the opportunity to enter into the blessing as we studied the great gateway into the spiritual gifts, which is the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Last week I studied with you here about the man behind church growth. And I told you of the qualities of men and women who can be consistently and effectively used of God for the salvation of souls. We learned eight definite things. And I told you that the man that will be used of God, a man that will be a vessel of honor in the hands of God, number one, he must be a man of secret prayer. It is the man of bended knees that becomes strong on his feet when he stands before the people. It is the one that ministers to God in the close set of prayer that will be able to minister the word of God to people when he stands before the congregation. I told you that such a man is not only a man of secret prayer, he's a man of searching purity. Depart ye, depart ye, ye that bear the vessel of the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. If we're going to be used of God, we must know what it means to worship the Lord in the holiness of life. And to know that without holiness, no man shall be able to see the face of the Lord or see the help of the Lord in his ministration. So then, somebody that will be used of God will be a person of secret prayer, a person of searching purity, which means he must be saved to start with. Without being saved, all that is done in the name of the Lord or in the work of the Lord is all in vain. It has no reward. It has no recognition by the Lord. Number two, he must be sanctified. That's why we say he's a man of purity. Not just a normal purity, but a searching, heartfelt purity. The Adamic nature is removed. Selfishness is taken away from the heart. And the very root of sin is uprooted. Before you can have the experience, you must believe it. If you don't believe it, you will not pray for it. If you don't believe it, if you are praying for it, you will not pray in faith. Before you can have such an experience of purity of heart, your heart must believe there is such a thing that is called purity. And if you are seeking the Lord for sanctification and purity, it can only be obtained if you are yielded and you are consecrated to the Lord and you are saying, Oh Lord, I actually want this experience. And you are putting everything upon the altar. There has been never anybody yet since the foundation of the world who got sanctified without desiring it, without praying for it, without believing it. God has never given anybody the sanctification experience who never cared for it, who never really took it seriously, or who prayed with half-hearted attention. If you are really going to be used of God, you are not going to come to the altar, coming to the Lord as a man that wants to do God a favor, 
saying, well, oh God, this is who I am, so great, so high, so rich, and so wealthy, so knowledgeable, and uh, well, I want to give my talents to you, I want to, I want to do your work, aren't you lucky, God, that I'm giving myself to you? Nobody like that was ever used of God. The proud, the arrogant, the know-it-all, the ultra-wise, all the people who feel they are mighty and noble, all the people that feel they have so much talent and so great talents before the Lord, that they're doing God a favor, that God will use them. You know, God passes them by. And God will rather raise up stones to be able to praise his name, raise up stones for Abraham, than you such people that are proud and pompous. What I'm saying is this. If you're going to be a man used of God in the age in which we live, in our own generation, you're going to be a man that goes before the Lord in secret prayer, in humility, telling the Lord, I am nothing, I am worth nothing, I am dust and ashes. All that I'm asking for is that the little thing that I present before you, the, the worthless, insignificant thing I present before you, you use it to the glory of your name. And when you come to the Lord like that, and you are a man of secret prayer, you're always in the chamber before the Lord, and you're searching your heart, you're seeking the Lord, you're saying, oh Lord, I just want to be used of you, and you are consecrating yourself to the Lord. Well, you can't do that except you are saved. You can't do that except you are really sanctified and your heart is purified. If you're a man of secret prayer, a man of searching purity, you're on the way, on the road to use fullness. Listen to me. There have been people who were praying before. Before they started doing something for the Lord, they were men of prayers. They could wake up early in the morning and pray. They could uh, watch in the night hold a night vigil all alone by themselves and watch and pray. They could follow the Lord right to the mountain top or to the solitary place and just pray. And they could follow the Lord into the secret chamber of the rooms and pray. They could follow the Lord to get semen and with agony and with tears and with anguish of heart, with a great burning of their heart, they pray. They could follow the Lord to get semen. They could follow the Lord to Golgotha and to Calvary and experience what it means for the flesh to be crucified while on their knees in prayer but you know they did that when they were young they did that when they were starting they did that when god was starting to use them but after the lord has been using them a few souls have been saved through their ministry a few people have been healed through their prayer a few people have testified that they receive miracles through their ministration you know they draw back they do not pray anymore they do not go with Moses days before the Lord, quaking and trembling while the cloud of the Lord is covering the mountain of the Lord. They do not follow the, they do not follow the men of God, Moses or and Aaron, lifting up the hands of prayer. They do not follow Abraham as he will begin to intercede all over the night for Sodom and Gomorrah, for the dying wicked city. They do not follow Elijah to the mountain of God while they are calling the power of God to let the fire of revival fall down. Neither do they follow Jesus Christ again to the mountain of prayer, just watching and praying with travail in their soul. Neither do they follow Paul the apostle who says for the care of the church all the time, fierce within and also fierce without. Praying and interceding with supplication and all tears. They do not follow the Lord like that anymore. And they wonder why the Lord can't use them anymore. And all the story they tell, the testimony they tell, is just, well, uh, God used me many years ago. God used me many, uh, many months ago. But today, they have forgotten the altar of prayer. Listen to me. Have you not known people who are very, very serious? I mean, very, very serious. Waiting upon the Lord, watching upon the Lord. Now they are doing something for the Lord, but they don't pray anymore. I don't want to be too personal, but you know, if I will ask Zona leaders right now, I mean, how many of them came with their Bibles? You might be shocked to find a Zona leader not having his Bible. 
If you were to ask how many of the ushers who are standing have Bibles, have outlines in their hands, you might be shocked how many of them do not think it's important to have an outline. That's what I'm saying. That before we became workers, before we yielded to the Lord, you know what? We were seeking the face of the Lord. We were men of secret prayer and also being sanctified. You give yourself to the Lord. You didn't care what people said about you. You didn't care which people greeted you or did not greet you. All you wanted was, oh Lord, this Adamic nature within me, this evil, this root of sin within me. I want it crucified. I want it uprooted. I want it taken away. I want my heart to be so full of the love of God. That was what you wanted. You wanted holiness. I mean transparent holiness. Holiness within, holiness without. Holiness in your room, holiness in your place of work. Holiness on the street, holiness on the bus. Holiness in the place of work. And whatever was questionable, whatever was wrong, you were not doing it at that time when you were pleading with the Lord, Oh Lord, use me. Oh Lord, use me. And you knew that if you regarded iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. That was the time you were saying, Oh Lord, whatever you will do for me, a real sanctification, purity, holiness experience, give it to me. You knew the time the fire fell. You knew the time that the hand of the Lord reached down inside your heart and uprooted the Adamic nature. You know after that time they could slap you on the one cheek you turn the other one. You know, at that time, every, anybody could offend you, you forgave. You know, at that time, people could step upon you, and it didn't matter to you at all, at all. People could persecute you. There was no pride. There was no hot temper. Everything was just peaceful and normal and pure. And all within your heart was crying, Oh God, when are you going to come? I'm ready to go. But you know, it's not like that today. The pursuit of riches... The pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of material things, the pursuit of worldly things have taken away. I've taken away the secret prayer and the searching purity. Follow me. I said, if you are going to be used of God, and you understand what I'm saying, you know that God is no respecter of persons. You know, God is not going to have a favorite. The Lord is not going to say, well, even though you are not praying, even though you are not pure, just because I just want to use you, I will use you. Nothing like that. A man that is going to be used of God must be a man of supernatural power. Not noise, power. Not feeling, power. Not shaking, power. Not emotion, power. Not just bullying on people, I mean power. And it doesn't matter where you are. By the brook of cherries, when there is no other man there, there is that power in the vessel, in the heart. It doesn't matter where you are, just ministering to a single widow of Sarifas, there is that power in the life of the man of God. Neither does it matter whether you are before Goliath or in the, burning, in the burning furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. There is power in the heart of that man that is going to be used of God. You know what the Bible says? It says, Jesus Christ went in the power of the Spirit. You know many people, they may be saved, they may be sanctified, they may even be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But you know, the point is, today, they do not understand how to continue to move and to flow in the power of God. I don't mean just shouting and making noise when you come before a demon-possessed person. In fact, you know what? If the power is really there, the noise will be less. Because we don't have to shout too much when the devil is already trembling before we open our mouth. We don't have to shout too much when the devil is already running away when he sees us marching and coming on. We do not have to shake. We do not have to manifest a great emotion when the evil spirits are already coming out, when the powers of darkness are already fleeing away because the light of the power of the Holy Ghost is within you being manifested. And you know that anywhere, when uh, Peter and John, when they came to the uh, temple gate, it wasn't the shouting, it was the authority of the faith and the power. And he said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have give I unto you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They had no money, they had, they had the power. The more money you have, listen to me, generally, 
It doesn't have to be like that, but unfortunately it's like that. The more money you have, the more clothes you have, the more material things you have, the more food you eat, it doesn't have to be like that, but it's like that. The more you have, the less of the power of God you have. Because you see, the more of these material things of the world you have, the less time you give to prayer. The more pursuit of the material things you are running after, running after, running after, the less you stay with Christ, with God in the closet. And the more friends you have downtown, everywhere, the less you are able to make Jesus Christ a friend, a companion, a master to, 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 to support you. And that, therefore, you see, we are losing the power of God because we do not know anymore how to maintain that power. But I told you that if we're going to be used of God, look, the field is already white for harvest. If I could just respond to the cause of all the people that are calling me, you might not be able to see me here in one whole year. Because you see, all over Nigeria, I receive invitations from uh, members of Deeper Life, I receive invitations from uh, university students outside Lagos State. They want me to come and preach to them. All the churches, Baptists, Pentecostal churches, Methodist, Anglican, many of the churches are calling. Why is it they're just writing letters to me alone? Why can't they call other people? Well, they're looking for people that have a testimony to their ministry. They're looking for people that are men of prayer, men of purity, men of power. And you know, if I cannot go to all these places, I should have been able to know hundreds out of thousands of people that are here, people that are ready for the call of God at any time. And I will say, go to such and such a place, go to such and such a place. But can you go without the power? Can you go without the support of the Almighty? Can you go without the anointing? Even outside Nigeria here, we're receiving letters. Right now, we, we have to send some of our full-time workers outside, outside Lagos, outside Nigeria. Because uh, we're still waiting for many of, many of you people to get ready, to get qualified, and to be real men of prayer. My brother, my sister, when you are a man of secret prayer, we will know it in the public. Because... You don't have to shout, you don't have to make a noise, you don't have to seek a place, you don't have to seek for position, but sharp-sighted spiritual leaders will know you. They will know that the hand of the Almighty is upon that vessel, a vessel of honor. And you see, when your purity is searching, just when you open your mouth to talk, everybody will know that this is a man because according to one man of God a holy person is an awesome weapon in the hand of God a single sentence people will be convicted of their sins a little testimony will you give because you are a man of secret prayer a man of searching purity people will be convicted of their sins they will be falling upon their faces saying oh Lord save me listen to me John Knox was such a man of secret prayer such a man of such impurity, such a man of supernatural power, they called him to preach in a place. And he came to that place and he came to the platform. All he said was, Oh God. Just those two words. He never opened the Bible. He never preached. Oh God. That's all he said. And revival came and people were rushing to the altar, getting their lives settled with God and getting saved. If we are still men of secret prayer, such impurity, supernatural power, you know what? God will be using us and the field is wide. The harvest is much and the laborers are few. I told you last week. That if you are going to be used of God, you will be men and women of strong persuasion. Not people who are not stable in doctrine. Not people who are looking for strange fire. Not people who are not satisfied with the revelation of the word of God in the Bible. God cannot use those who are unstable in doctrine. God cannot use those who are not steady in their faith, in their belief. God cannot use those who are not steady in their consecration. Listen to me. You know, some time ago, somebody came to Billy Graham and he told Billy Graham that uh, he wanted to donate to him thousands of acres. He wanted to donate to him also millions of dollars if, on one condition, Billy Graham will do one thing. 
if Billy Graham will cooperate with him and both of them will build a university, a Christian university that will compete with Harvard and Yale. Those are high, great universities in America. Billy Graham said, I will pray about it. And um, he prayed. And after six months, he went back to that man. He said, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. God has not called me to establish a university so I can have a great name. God has called me to go into all the world as an evangelist. And that man pleaded with him and said, Billy Graham, you don't have to do anything whatever. Thousands of acres, the land is there. Millions of dollars. I'll build all the hostels and all the faculties. I will pay all the stuff. Billy Graham said, no, I'm sorry. I am an evangelist. All I want to do is to tell people that Jesus can save and they can get ready for heaven. In 1976, the president of America called the Billy Graham and his wife and also called that man that had wanted to donate uh, that land and money to Billy Graham because the queen uh, came from England and went to America and uh, the president of America called the uh, Billy Graham and his wife so that they can uh, be at uh, the reception of the queen and while they were lining up to shake hands with the queen Bill Graham and the wife was there, and this man that wanted to give land and money was there. And uh, the man came to Billy Graham on the line and said, Billy, if you had only said yes to the offer I made to you some years ago, and you have accepted the thousands of acres and the millions of dollars, we would have built the university now. Billy Graham looked back at him and said, my friend, I believe I'm doing the will of the Lord. I am an evangelist. That's a man of strong persuasion. You couldn't buy him with money. You couldn't change his conviction at all. You see, if God is going to trust us, if God is going to use us, we must be people that are of strong persuasion. I told you that you, the person must be a man of scriptural preaching. He must also be a man of saintly purpose, a man of spiritual perception, a man of sound principles. Let me ask you, do you consider all these things I've been telling you? Or do you only come to Monday Bible study and you hear the word and you sit before me and yet the fire of the word, the hammer of the word never does anything in your heart? God will not send an angel to come and preach to you and turn you around to be a man of prayer, a man of purity, a man of power. Listen to me. Don't you know you are getting old? Don't you know you are older today than you were last year? Are you not counting your days? Don't you know how long you have given your life to the Lord and you have become a Christian? Haven't you ever laid anything on the altar since you came to the Lord? Since you have been coming, hasn't the Spirit of God been speaking to you? To do something, but you know, that thing will never be done until you become a man of prayer, a man of purity, a man of supernatural power. As you are all full of anger and temper and worldliness and the pursuit of the things of the world, you, do you want God to just forget about it and pick another man? Or don't you know you are wasting God's time as he's waiting, calling upon you, saying, how long will I wait for you? And yet, except you really start, except you really start, and you get on your bended knees, and you become a man of secret prayer, searching purity, supernatural power, you are tempting the Lord to forsake you, and you are tempting the Lord to go and pick another person. How long will God wait? Are you of strong persuasion? Do you believe this doctrine of the Bible? What are those doctrines? Repentance, restitution, salvation in the name and by the atonement of Jesus Christ alone, sanctification and purity of heart, holiness of heart without which no man shall see the Lord, and spiritual power, supernatural power coming as a result of the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What are those doctrines? Divorce, 
and remarriage is cancelled by the word of God. It is not allowed by the word of God. That's the doctrine. Marriage was married to only one woman for a lifetime. That's the doctrine. Are you a man of strong persuasion? Do you believe the rapture will appear? The rapture will happen before the tribulation? And after the saints have gone, do you believe that there will be a time of great tribulation upon the people that are living on the face of the earth? And after that, do you believe the Lord is coming and the dead, in Christ, and the dead shall rise up and then they'll go through the millennial reign of the Lord? Do you believe it? You know, if you have believed it before, but now you are reading some books that will buy by the wayside. Listen to me. Those books can cancel the call of God from your life. Because, you know, years ago, zonal leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, members of the choir, workers in the ministry, years ago, you believed without sanctification, we should not even start praying for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But you have been reading, you have been reading these books you buy by the wayside. And the writers do not know about the holiness experience, the, uh, the sanctification experience, the uprooting of the Adamic nature. And it tells you that, you know, all you need to do is to say hallelujah seven times or however many times and start speaking in tongues without purity. And you are changing already. How do you want God to use you? Already following out a strange doctrine. If God is going to use you, you are not only a, a man of prayer, purity, and power, you are a man of persuasion. You know what you believe. And you know, I have to remind you of all these things. Lest you just receive the grace of God in vain. God wants us to be pillars in the household of faith. A harvester in the spiritual harvest in front of us. A laborer in God's vineyard, a steward of the mysteries of God, a preacher of Christ's unsearchable riches, a guide of the blind, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the babes, an ambassador of God. And we cannot be this if we are prayerless and purposeless members of the church. To be that and to be used of God. We must be vessels unto honor, sanctified, separated, set apart, committed, and suitable for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Ready at any time. Ready at any time. And you must be asking yourselves questions as you are listening to me. Obviously, you want God to use you. You don't want to fold your hand. Because souls are dying. People are perishing. They're waiting for somebody that will tell them that Jesus saves. They're waiting for somebody that will tell them how to escape for their lives and escape the judgment of God and the fire of hell. They want somebody who can tell them the sure way to heaven, how they can make heaven their home at last. Many people are confused because of many religions in the world. And they want somebody who can tell them the sure way to heaven. They are waiting. They've been waiting for a long time. How long must they wait? But they must keep on waiting until we start to pray. They must keep on waiting until we start to receive the purity experience, the purifying, sanctifying blood of Jesus in our heart and experience. They must keep on waiting until we can have the power of God. They must keep on waiting until we know what we believe. We're persuaded beyond any shadow of doubt of the doctrines of Christ. They must keep on waiting until we study the Bible, we search the scriptures, and we become men of scriptural preaching. They must keep on waiting until we have saintly purpose. The only purpose in our lives, setting our faces as a flint to go towards the preaching of the gospel and to do what the Lord wants us to do, come what may. Let me show you the equipment we have, then the encouragement from the Lord, then the example, then our expectation, the equipment. In Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Please look up here. When Jesus was speaking to the people, he was speaking to people who had self-denial. 
He was speaking to people who counted the salvation of souls, the only thing, the only important thing in the world. I want you to see the consequence of what Jesus was saying. He said, you receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. That is easy. But then in Samaria, a man that is going to be used of God must not have any discrimination in his heart. But you know, if you are so much a Yoruba man that you discriminate against the Igbos, you are not going to leave Jerusalem to go to Samaria. If you are such an Igbo man, Igbo in your blood, Igbo in your heart, Igbo in your eye, Igbo in your affection, Igbo in everything, you are not going to go to the north, to the outside people, to Samaria to preach the gospel. And if all you know is uh, all the food you enjoy is the food in Nigeria, you are not going to go to Kenya, you are not going to go to Ghana, because their diet is different. The Lord, the people was talking to, they are the men that do not care for the food, do not care for the language, do not care for the tribe, do not care where it is, wherever it may be. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, wherever it may be, in Samaria, or in Judea, or even to the uttermost part of the earth. You may even have to learn their language. And you are not going to start learning French if you are not committed. If you don't have a vision to go into the French-speaking countries and preach this gospel, you are not going to learn French. You are just going to say, well, I don't understand their language. Didn't the Lord know that? When he was saying, you will go to the uttermost part of the earth, I have the language barrier. Well, you will learn the language. If you're really serious, if you have a purpose in heart, if you want to live for the Lord, you are going to learn the language. How about their food they eat, which is different from ours? That doesn't matter to a man of prayer, a man of purity, a man of power, a man of persuasion, a man who wants to preach. He will go, no matter the call, no matter the place, he will go, he will do it. It may be Jerusalem, it may be Judea, it may be Samaria, it may be uttermost part of the earth where he has to learn their language. A man that has a purpose to preach will learn it. And so the equipment, you must equip yourself. And do you know, my brother, my sister, it's so heavy on my heart. Because, you know, if we wake up in the morning and sleep in the night, and we wake up the second day and sleep the second day and we run day by day like that when are we going to rise up and work for God? listen to me do you know when this year started? it was just like yesterday look at how fast the time is going already now we are near the end of the year again you know another year will start and you are growing old you are getting settled. You are forgetting that people outside are perishing. And there is no desire. There is no passion. There is no cry. There is nothing. No burden within your heart. How long shall we continue like this? We must pray. We must be pure. We must have the power. And when the power is there, you will not care for the dressing of the people. When the power is there, you will not care for the barriers, for the tribe, for the language of the people. You'll be willing to go anywhere, anytime. You say, but I'm a woman. Well, if you make yourself a woman, so you are. Deborah was a woman. She rose up like a man. And told uh, a man, he said, you go and pursue them. And that man was the woman. The woman was the man. That man said, I cannot, Deborah, except you follow me. And Deborah said, I will follow you. I care nothing for the noise of the battle. I care nothing for the danger in the way. I care nothing for the chariots of the runners. I care not for the fierceness of the enemies. I am a woman on the face. I am a man at heart. And I will follow. But the glory shall be to a woman. You know, it doesn't matter who you are, if you can pray, if you are pure, 
if the power is there, if you are persuaded beyond anybody that can ever confuse you on doctrine, if you swallow the Bible, study the Bible, search the Bible, if you are saturated with Scripture, it doesn't matter. God can use the jawbone of an ass. God can use a stone out of the sling. God can use even an ass talking to the prophet Balaam. God can use a woman as well. The only thing is that the qualification must be there. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Think about it. Ambassador for Christ, witnesses unto me. You women, you know how to sell. There is something to sell, which they buy without money, where they don't have to labor for. There is something to talk about. You women, you know how to talk. There is something to talk about. You know how to love. There is something, there's somebody to love. Why can't we, with all the God-given abilities that God has given us, sell out the gospel, reach out of the gospel, proclaim the gospel, and tell the people that are perishing, they don't have to perish because the Lord can save them? That's the equipment, the power of God. What's the encouragement? Matthew chapter 28 verse 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even unto the end of the world what else do you need? The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of angels, the Master of the storm, the one who overcame the devil on Calvary, who dealt a death blow to the devil, and who said it is finished. He said, I am with you. Always. Always. You appear before Pharaoh. You are not going to go alone. You stand up in the public to declare my name. You are not going to go alone. You tell the people, barbarians, the unwise, those who have never known you, who may even tear you up because of the enmity of religion in their hearts, you are not going to go alone. I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world, if it were possible for you to get to the end of this earthly terrestrial ball, he is there. Where is he not? If you go into the depths of the sea, if there are people there to preach to, he is there. If you go to the stars, far up above, if there are people there to preach to, he is there. If you go to the jungle, the wilderness, if there are people there to preach to, he is there. If you go to strangers that have never known you, he is there. And it says, behold, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, until the end of time. Oh yes, the end of time is a time of war and rumors of war. He says, let not your heart be troubled. I'm with you. Anywhere, he sends. Everywhere, he sends. He says, I'm there. I'm there with you. How happy we are to know that underneath, underneath are the everlasting arms. When we are running for the Lord, when we are going for the Lord, there is no danger that can swallow up a servant of God. Think about it. Don't forget the burning bush. The fire may surround the bush. If that bush is on the mountain of the Lord, there is no fear. It cannot burn. Israel may be in Egypt and the affliction may be great. If the Lord is there, there is no danger. The taskmasters may put the whips on their backs. If the Almighty, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, if he is behind them, they cannot perish, they cannot die. I am with you till the end of the world. What if we go to the riverside and all our companion is the raven that is bringing bread every day. There is no danger and sleep there without a house, without blocks, without protection. If the Lord is there, there is no danger. I am with you till the end of the world. What if we go to idol worshippers who have never heard about Jesus, who have never known, 
who are even hostile. If the Lord is sending us there, there is no danger. I am with you till the end of the world. What if we even get into the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The false man has not forgotten his duty. While you pass through the fire, I will be with you. While you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And they will not overflow you, neither will the fire burn you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. What are we afraid of? He that keeps his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall save it unto the eternal day. You've seen the equipment. It's the power of God. You've seen the encouragement. It's there all the time. How about the example? In Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's the example. The apostles told the people, we will give ourselves. It's a personal commitment, wholehearted commitment. They opened wide their eyes. They knew what they were saying. They knew the commitment they were making. They knew the consequence of what they were getting into. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. Listen to me. What are you thinking about? Marriage? What shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I wear? What will the future hold? How will I train my children? What did the master say? Think not of these things. Why take ye thought for raiment? Look at the birds of the air. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. You seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And after that, all these things he will add unto you. You have the precious ointment. You have the gospel. You have the life. You have the word of God. The word of eternal life. And there are people that are hungry, thirsty, perishing. And as long as you are folding your arms and doing nothing, they are perishing. Because selfishly you are considering, well, you don't want an insult. You don't want any difficulty. You want to live an easy life. Don't think like that. Don't think like that. Other people sacrificed their lives to translate the Bible into English for you to read. Other people took journeys. You know, those days when there was um, no aeroplane and they came in shapes from far away countries to come and tell you and tell our people the word of the Lord. Have you not read in history books some of those Englishmen that brought the gospel? They exposed themselves to the danger of mosquitoes. Malaria caught them. Many of them died on the African shore. Many of them were swept away in River Niger. Seeking the people they will save. Here we are today by the grace of God because the Bible is in our hand. Because some preachers came, we have been saved. But then we're sitting down. We should do something. There are still people in faraway lands, in many, even in this Lagos state where we are. We don't even have to travel abroad. There are neighbors who have never known about Jesus that says there are people living in the same block where you are who have never known that Jesus is the Savior. There are people living on your street. There are people in the marketplaces everywhere in this Lagos who have not been saved. Don't you know time is gone? Don't you know the Lord is coming? Don't you know any time from now the trumpet can sound? If the trumpet sounds now, if only you people that are here tonight or the people that were here yesterday and a few more other people in other churches are the only people that make the rapture, where will the world be? 
Think about it. We've got the example. The apostle said, we commit ourselves, we give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. What's the expectation? Was the Lord asking us? Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 6. He shall hear of, of wars and rumors of wars. That's not your problem. That shouldn't be the, the, the main discussion you have in the offices about austerity, about politics, about tries, about things that are material, about scarcity of uh, commodities that are needed. That's not your discussion. You are a believer, you are a preacher, you are an ambassador of Christ. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Because... Uh, the master has called you. Don't let all the wars and rumors of wars and the things you read about and all the things you are hearing about uh, other countries bother you. You have a call that is the expectation of the Lord. And it says, for well, all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. I mean the wars and the rumors of wars. I mean the economy that is breaking down, crumbling in many, many countries. I missed all that. Jesus has put the preaching of the gospel in your hand. And he has said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. When we have done it, then shall the end come. Rise up and let us pray. Do something for the Lord, please. Don't stay idle. Don't stay idle. See Jesus on Calvary. In his cry. In his bleeding. For his sake. Because of his agony. Because of his death. Do something. Tell the sinners. Watch over their souls. Bring them to the Lord. Preach the gospel. Let his hand be upon you. Tell the loss of the Savior. Tell the sinners of the hope of glory. Tell them, tell them, and bring them to the Lord. Tell your neighbors about Jesus the Savior. Don't let these people perish. Save the lost. 